Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Joan Pepin. I am our Director of Security here at SEMA. I've been here three years this week, so uh, yay for me. Um, I'm employee number 11, so I've been here since very near the beginning, uh, helping to ensure that our service is trustworthy from a security perspective, that we can be entrusted with your company's sensitive data. And so that's pretty much my mission and my job. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the things that make a service provider trustworthy, some of the things that you should look for, and some of the ways in which you should be prepared when you search for a service provider to make sure that you are, you are getting the type of uh, security and trust that um, you require for what you're doing. Um, here we go. So trust. Um, we're here to talk about trust. And trust is critical to any business relationship. But this is especially true of services which involve sensitive data or are business critical. So an analogy I like to make is, you know, you do business with a caterer. Um, and you, you know, are going to want to trust that that caterer is going to show up on time for your event and that, you know, the food is going to be good and they're going to bring enough. And that's definitely trust in that relationship, especially if you paid them in, in advance. But if they fail to come through on that, you're left with an inconvenience. You might be out some money that, you know, you would have to take some recourse in order to get back. But chances are your business will continue to operate. And chances are also that you haven't given that caterer anything that can be used against you or that could be exposed and embarrass you. So that's one level of trust. But it's very different than the level of trust that you get into where you have a contractual agreement with a service provider who has access to your core information or whom you're relying on for some of your core business processes. That's an entirely different level of trust. And the due diligence behind entering into that type of relationship is going to be different than the type of diligence that you would enter before hiring a caterer. So I'm here primarily to talk about that higher level of trust, uh, about that, that sharing of information or of critical business processes. And so there are a couple of questions that I have around that. And they're sort of open questions. I'm going to try to give some answers. But these are just sort of things that you want to kind of think about and keep rolling around because I don't think there is necessarily one or even a set of correct answers to these. But one important question is, what makes a business trustworthy? And another one is, how can that trustworthiness be demonstrated? And so we're going to talk about some of those things. Um, I did, in preparation for this webinar, I did some research on the word trust because I, I don't like to... Um, you know, sort of talk about something that I don't really understand. And there's a bunch of different meanings for the word trust, but the one that I am referring to, I found a fantastic definition for from a, um, a very old dictionary uh, from around 1450. The word trust was used primarily in a business sense, apparently, uh, back then. And it was defined as the confidence placed in one who holds or enjoys the use of property entrusted to him by its legal owner. And that is exactly what I'm talking about today. Here at Sumo Logic, our customers entrust us with their log data uh, or other machine-generated data. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we show at least as much care uh, and stewardship of that data, if not more, than the customers who entrust that to us. And so how did we get there? How do we do that? And if we're looking for a service provider because we have to extend that chain of trust, how do we do that and what do we look for? Well, the first, as, as I hinted at, uh, at my opening slide, one of the first things that you need to understand is what is it that you need? What is it that you have that you need to be trustworthy uh, with, that, that you need to trust someone else with? And so a key step there is understanding what your regulatory, compliance, and contractual obligations are. Um, all too often, one or more of those things will slip through the cracks when uh, vendors are being considered, when contracts are being written. People might have in mind that, you know, they're regulated. We, we fall under HIPAA and we have to worry about HIPAA, but then they might forget that they have different contracts with different customers that might have different stipulations. Um, so keeping all of those constraints in mind is going to be very important. And so what are those constraints? And within each of those constraints, what types of data or services 
are those constraints concerned with? So here, I've, I'm going to carry through this presentation three different examples. So you might be an entity which is covered by HIPAA, uh, which deals with FI, protected health information. You might be an entity which falls under PCI, in which case you're worried about CHI, you're worried about um, cardholder information. You might also have SLAs or contracts with your customers that could, among other things, um, deal with um, PII, personally identifiable information. There are, of course, lots of other regulations or con contractual needs that you might come up with, but I felt like these were a good three to sort of work with as an example to, in this presentation. So understanding your current system boundaries is very important. Where does your sensitive data live? Right? What machines does it live on? What hard drives does it live on? Uh, what state is it in? Is it encrypted? Who has the keys? Uh, if it is encrypted, um, if it's not encrypted, should it be encrypted? Right? Who has access? Who has access to change the keys to perform key operations? You need to understand all those things yourself very well before you can start entrusting them to other people. I do um, deal in situations occasionally where we have customers who are highly regulated, um, but yet do not seem to understand exactly where their highly regulated data lives or what their uh, obligations are to it. Um, so it would be very easy if I were, you know, less than ethical to get into a deal with one of these people where I promise them that absolutely they're, they're, they're being taken care of and they might not know that they weren't be, uh, that they wouldn't be. So they need to understand, you need to understand, just as we understand, where is your, where, where are um, the family jewels, right? What, what are they, where are they, and how are they being protected? And what are your mission critical systems? And what are your mission critical processes? And who performs them? And how are they performed? And what safeguards are in place? Because if you don't know your, require, your requirements in advance, your vendor or service provider might be all too happy to define them for you, right? And then you wind up in a situation where you're in a contract that's not meeting your needs, or worse, is detrimental to your needs. So um, Shakespeare's character Polonius in Hamlet gave one of the best pieces of advice uh, in life, and I think it very much applies to this situation as well, which is, above all, know thyself and to thine own self be true. Uh, it is much easier to find a trustworthy service provider who meets your needs if you know exactly what those needs are. So to that end, um, I've come up with a couple of example charts here that we're going to go over. So uh, this first one I call requirements map to use cases. So I have those three um, constraints that I listed above, PCI and HIPAA and SLAs. And then over here I, on the left-hand column, I've got a number of different services that you might be thinking about outsourcing or putting in the cloud or however you want to put it. And for each of those, I have gone through, now this is just an example. This is not necessarily the way it is. Your company might have very different answers for each one of these columns. But this is for an example company, one that probably looks a little bit like Sumo Logic, uh, that says for each of these services, is that type of data or is that constraint something that is related? So if I'm going to outsource my customer relationship management, is there cardholder information involved in that relationship? Is that something where I have to worry about PCI? Do I have protected health information in, in, in that CRM system or would I put it there? So do I have to worry about HIPAA? Do I have contracts or SLAs that deal with PII that I would be sending to the CRM? And so in the case of the CRM, you know, a typical uh, answer would be, no, PCI isn't a concern, and no, HIP is not a concern. But yes, we have SLAs with our customers. We have contracts with our customers where we, we say that we will protect their PII and not send it to a third party or only send it to a third party who has certain certifications. So in the case of shopping around for a CRM, I'm able to narrow it down and say, okay, these are the constraints that I'm worried about. My boundaries of trust with this CRM provider are around this type of data. And so similarly, for a billing application, if you're going to outsource your billing, that might have much broader implications. That might very well involve your PCI data and your HIPAA data and your SLAs. Something like a lead generation, once again, might only come back to PII. In the case of, uh, of log management, which is what we do for a living, um, ideally, 
Um, PCI and HIPAA are not concerns for your log management because ideally you are not logging any protected health information and you're not logging any cardholder information. Now maybe there are certain cases where, where you might be. And if that is the case, you should be very well aware that that is the case and where those logs are living and what their level of protections are and how access to those is audited. And uh, that is something, um, by the way, that you know, we're prepared for here at Sumo Logic. If you do have that type of data in your log stream, uh, we are competent and trustworthy to handle that and we've made sure of that. But in most cases, it shouldn't actually be a concern. Uh, then you have a case where you know, maybe your R&D team wants to uh, operate some uh, some instances, some virtual machines in the cloud to do some quick research. Uh, and you might be involved in that decision. And upon scoping it out, you might see, hey, this actually doesn't involve any of our constraints. And so, you know, maybe we can go with something um, that's cheap and fast and we don't really have to worry because we're not in that case compromising any of these things. Versus if we're thinking about spinning up a virtual machine in the cloud for our production data, that might be very different and might, in fact, touch all three of the constraints that we're discussing here. So this is just sort of an example matrix of how I might begin um, this hunt for a service provider and what I'm going to look for there. So now if we take that down a layer, and we're going to talk about boundaries. Boundaries and interfaces are very important to trust. Understanding where my responsibility ends and someone else's responsibility begins is very important as part of your assessment process. So in this matrix, I've sort of broken down the various layers of your application delivery from the physical network, um, I threw in the hypervisor level there, access control layer, perimeter security, and application security. And you know we'll talk about various ways of deploying this service or application. So, for instance, if I'm going to build something in-house, obviously that's all my responsibility, right? Every layer of the system will be something that I have to understand, that I have to certify, um, and that I have to worry about. Whereas, if I take that, that first step into the cloud and I use an infrastructure as a service provider, such as Amazon or Rackspace, uh, then I am giving responsibility, I'm entrusting responsibility for some of those layers to my IAAS provider. Um, in this case, that would usually be the physical layer, the network layer, and the hypervisor layer. Um, and then the operating system layer and access control um, goes to you, who's implementing the service on the IAAS. In this case, uh, something like perimeter security might be more complicated. That might be shared. Your service provider will probably have firewalls that they will manage. And then you will probably have some sort of control, either through API or through running your own host level firewalls, to add additional protection or perhaps to alter the default protection. And so you will have layers of responsibility which are shared. And that's something that you're going to want to understand very well going into the relationship is, where am I completely entrusting this person? Where is it completely my responsibility? And where is this something where I'm going to have to work together with my service provider, either through code or in some sort of a human relationship with their customer service or their support organization or whomever. Then if we take this a step further to a SaaS application, um, that becomes even more shifting the responsibility. As we move to the right of this matrix, I'm shifting the responsibility further and further away from me, right? So if we go to a SaaS provider, um, then you're, you know, obviously the physical network, hypervisor layer, the application layer security are all the vendor's responsibility. Access control is probably going to be shared. In other words, you're going to have the responsibility of provisioning which users have access to the service and maybe how much access to that service they have. And then to, for the perimeter security, this might be a shared responsibility, it might not. Maybe you'll be involved. So an example would be um, if you are uh, using a SaaS provider that allows you to block certain IP addresses from accessing the application um, for your organization. That would be something where you would have shared control, where you would be, have to give the service provider uh, a list of either whitelisted or blacklisted IP addresses. So that's an area of potentially shared control. 
And then all the way to the right, you have an MSP model. You have a managed service provider model where they're pretty much going to take responsibility for everything except possibly who has access and who, who, who doesn't to the application. So if we take this previous slide and as our basis and then we build on it with this, we should have a very tight sort of three-dimensional matrix around what it is that we're entrusting, where those responsibilities begin and end, and therefore what it is that we need to look for specifically in that service provider. So let's talk about what to look for. So a key uh, part of my philosophy is to be transparent to our customers, and that is something that I in turn look for in service providers that I'm going to do business with, right? A big key to trust is letting me know what it is that you're doing, right? If I'm going to trust you with my data or my money or my car, I might want to know where, what you're going to do with it, where you're going to keep it, how you're going to treat it. And the more that you can tell me about that, the more that you can share that with me, um, obviously the more I'm going to trust you. So is your service provider upfront with their policies and practices? Do they have documentation that you can see? Um, you, you know, will they share those policies and practices with you? And there's a couple layers to that. Um, you've got companies that deal with this in different ways. We tend to be very direct in sharing our policies and procedures. I do ask that our customers be under a non-disclosure agreement before I share all sorts of uh, proprietary information with them. But upon having that NDA, I'm pretty open. There are other companies which think about things differently. They have auditors or third-party assessors who will uh, audit their policies, and the company might not be comfortable ever actually showing you their actual policy, but they will instead give you their audit, give you their third-party assessment, where the, the CPA says, I have seen their policies, and they're in order, and they look good. And in that case, you're sort of trusting the CPA's judgment. There are a lot of larger companies who feel that giving their specific security policies would be a uh, potentially a security breach. So rather than give them directly, they have this intermediate where they're, they're giving you the word of someone whose job it is to give their word that everything is in order. Um, I have no problem myself personally doing business with companies that operate that way. I understand those concerns. But that is sort of two levels of transparency to be aware of. Um, the level of transparency that I would be very wary of is the one that says, I'm not going to show you anything, and I don't have, an, I don't have a third-party assessment for it. Um, that's a red flag. Another thing to look for is, is there someone in charge at this service provider? Whom there is responsible for the security? Um, do they have a privacy officer? Is that a shared role? Is that something that... Um, one person does both. Are there two people? Are there more than two people? Is there nobody who's in charge of this? Uh, not what my, my former boss would call a single throat to choke. Um, that would be a, a, a red flag. Um, what is their compliance framework? What is their compliance footprint? Um, do they, are they required to comply with anything? Do they voluntarily comply with anything? And can you speak to this person who's in charge? Can you have a te telephone call or go out to lunch with them? Is there a way that you can sort of one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on, understand what uh, their posture is and, and speak to the person who's responsible for that before you entrust them with your data? I've mentioned third-party assessments. I think this is very important to trust. Have they had their services examined by a neutral third party who's qualified and competent to do that? Um, that's something that does, it is an investment of time and money on behalf of the service provider, but I firmly believe that that is a necessary investment if they're going to win certainly my trust. Can you see their reports, right? You know, that if they have been examined or assessed or audited, um, can you actually see the results of that, in, in, you know, in total? Once again, you might need to sign an NDA for that. I, I, I ask our customers to sign an NDA before I share our third-party assessments with them, but I absolutely share our third-party assessments with them once I have that NDA. What is the history of this company? An old friend of mine uh, often says that the only thing you can rely on people to do is the thing that they've done over and over again in the past. So what is the history of this company? Um, do they have references? Can you talk to some of their other customers? Ideally, customers that are like you. 
You know, if you are a mid-sized technology company looking to do business with somebody, do they have any other mid-sized technology companies who are their customers that you can speak to? Do they have a customer forum or a customer advisory board that you could join, that you could sit in, that you could talk to other customers? How transparent are they about their customer base and how willing are they to let you talk to their other customers? That can be a big hint. Everybody has an incident at some point in time. Everybody has a security breach or an accident or an act of God that happens at some point in time if you're in business long enough. What's more important than avoiding, you know, at all costs these incidents, because they can't be avoided even at all costs, is how those incidents were dealt with. Does this company have a reputation and a history of owning up to their mistakes, of making things right, um, of issuing refunds, of proactively notifying, um, or do they have a history of being difficult to deal with? Do they hide their information? Are they slow to update, um, et cetera? Really, if there's something going on, if there's a problem, I believe sort of the character and the trustworthiness of a company or a person comes through in how they deal with that situation. So simply because, you know, a company might have, uh, right, oh, they, you know, they had this outage last year. Well, how did they deal with that outage? How did they communicate that outage? How quick were they to fix that outage? And how quick were they to issue refunds? Those are things to look for. Now, there are a couple of things that I'm going to talk about uh, how to avoid. The main problem in this type of decision is confusion. There are so many layers and so many boundaries. You might have, like I said, at least three or four or more you know, constraints on you. You've got contracts. You've got regulatory things. You've got company policies that maybe you don't have any control over. Um, there's all different types of data. There are all these different layers, the physical layer, you know, there's all these demarcations of responsibility. It can get legitimately confusing. People can honestly, you know, give you a wrong answer, give you a bad answer because they don't quite understand what's going on. But then there are other people who take advantage of that confusing situation. And I'll give you a couple of examples that I see over and over again in the service provider business where people are taking advantage of the confusion and the ambiguity. And the first is what I call the data center certification. You are looking at some cool whiz-bang cloud service provider and you realize that you're going to have to share some sensitive data with them in order to utilize their cool whiz-bang service. And you ask them, do you have any third-party assessments? Are you certified? Do you have a SOC 2 or um, a PCI certification or, you know, an ISO 27001 or any of these things. And so many companies are very quick to come back and say, absolutely, our data center is certified ISO 27001 and has a FISMA authorization to operate. Well, that's fantastic for their data center, but that doesn't mean that they've built a secure application on top of that data center and that that application has been assessed. So I can, um, I can rent space in a perfectly secure, well-certified data center and build an application that takes all of your data and sends it to spies. That really won't help you, and that's not what you want. And time and time again, I see people fall for this. The service provider will say, oh, absolutely, our data center is certified. Meanwhile, there is a completely unassessed um, and possibly fragile and insecure system running in that data center. And, you know, the poor, confused buyer believes that they are purchasing a service which has been examined and certified, and they are not. Um, I am immediately wary anytime I go to a, uh, a company's webpage and they talk about their data center certification, and I don't see anything about their certification. To me, that's a giant red flag. Another one is the service description. This is a little more clever of, of a deception, and I, I will call it a deception. There are a lot of companies who do get a uh, third-party assessor to take a look at part of their service. But that's exactly it. That only a part of their service has been assessed. There are vendors out there that offer, you know, 15, 20 different services from their menu of SKUs, but they've only had an auditor or an examiner actually look at one or two of them. And so, you know, you'll see all over the place, PCI certified, you know, HIPAA compliant. Um, but 
only after reading all of the service descriptions and actually getting your hands on the copy of the report will you realize that some small some some small service oh that we we had our authentication service examined but not the other 19 services that rely on that right so um, being very careful about what service you're actually buying and, and, and whether or not that service has actually been examined and certified and what is the description for that service is another very common pitfall uh, that people get into. Um, so I hope I've given um, some good examples of, of you know, what to sort of what to look for and what to avoid and what the scope of this decision um, should be. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. All right, great. Um, and I still have some questions coming in here. Um, we have time for just a few. Um, so just a reminder, please put your, your questions either in the Q&A window or you can send them uh, in chat to the host, Sumo Logic. Um, and with that, we'll get the first question out there. And the first one is, how does Sumo Logic encrypt uh, the data it's collecting? So uh, we are engineering ourselves to the NIST 800-53 standard, which is a, a, a government-sponsored uh, standard for security. And um, by that standard, we are using AES-256 CBC encryption um, as our standard encryption for data at rest. Great. All right, and the next question we've got here is what's uh, certifications, if any, does Sumo Logic have? Uh, so we currently carry a, um, a SOC 2 Type 2 attestation. Uh, we carry an attestation of HIPAA compliance as well. And we are in the process of going through our PCI uh, DSS service provider level one certification, which we hope to complete in the next couple of months. Great. And the next question we've got here is, do you guarantee an SLA model if there's any kind of guarantee or uh, if the SLA is not achieved, what happens? So we do have SLAs. Um, I, I'm not intimately familiar with exactly what they are, but we absolutely, uh, as an enterprise service provider, have service level agreements around our service. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the event that we uh, don't meet our SLAs, that we offer service credits for that, absolutely. Um, I, there's a question about using AES-256 internationally. Uh, currently, none of our data is international. All of our data is currently stored inside the continental United States. Okay, great. Um, just have just one time for one more question. Um, and there's a lot of them coming in, so we apologize. Um, Okay, great. Is um, this question is Sumo Logic is a DC per service provider, correct? So uh, we do not operate in our own data center. We are hosted um, out of uh, Amazon Web Services, um, with whom we have a fantastic relationship, and I'm happy to recommend. Uh, we make full use of their security suite, as well as we operate in a way. Um, this is kind of funny for me to say, we operate in a way where we basically don't trust Amazon, even though we very much trust Amazon. Uh, we keep everything hidden from them. Everything is encrypted in transit and at rest, uh, et cetera, so that uh, were there some sort of uh, malicious employee or breach at Amazon, uh, we are protected uh, from them. And the fact that they offer so many rich and robust tools that allow us to do that is one of the primary reasons that we utilize their service over their competitors. Right. And the last question is that um, we are not a competitor to Amazon, like Joan mentioned. Um, you know, we actually uh, integrate with them for several of their applications, including AWS CloudTrail and CloudFront as well. Um, so we have several other questions. Please feel free to um, 
send any of your questions to webinars at sumologic.com that we were not able to address today. Again, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar um, to everyone that attended and registered for it. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed. Have a good one, everybody.